All right, okay, how you do? So, so anyway, uh, you're, uh, do you currently live in Germany? Yep. Yes, uh, I used to, I spent some time uh, with Joe, I was just thinking about 10, 11 years ago. Yes. Then, wow. Then we parted ways and I left to Hanover, which is kind of in the middle of Germany. Ah, oh, wow, no way. And you, what you, to, to, to go over there, you would give it, you, it was a job opportunity that took you over there. Was it to study? Yep. Yep. So it's to carry on studying. So biology, um, immunology. Um, I thought I'll stay here for three years, but then I met my future wife. But now I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> always the case, always the case. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, obviously you absolutely love it out there I was just looking at the numbers uh, for um, at the moment with COVID-19 over there um, and just talking to Joe just before you came onto the chat yeah. and it was, it was blowing my mind because with Germany they seem to be at this stage as we're doing this on the 20th of April, because it constantly changes. It's like, uh, I feel like I need to give a date because I feel like in about three days, this will all be completely different. <laughs> and oh, we'll, yeah. yeah, we'll probably know a little bit more about it or, uh, you know, um, or the situation may have changed. But as it stands, Germany are starting to slowly come uh, loosen their, the, the, the lockdown that they've put on, uh, obviously not fully loosen it, uh, which I don't think any country will do. But uh, it's crazy with the numbers because they they have got a considerable more amount of tests that have been done in Germany currently, um, and but the, the the as opposed to England, you know what I mean? The England's test, I think they're only at about five hundred thousand they've done so far. Whereas Germany is, is about 1,000, uh, 1, 1, 700,000. Do you think that testing is the reason for Germany being in a way better position? Um, yeah, it looks like it. So everything you hear in the media um, and also what you can kind of interpret um, by yourself as well, it seems to be that Germany's got um, to start a bit earlier. So when it was about four or five weeks ago, just before the lockdown um, really started, I remember the UK was saying um, that Germany was two weeks in front of us. Um, oh, the UK was saying, I think Johnson was saying, you, um, Germany is two weeks further along um, the timeline. Um, I was thinking, hmm, if you can look at the signs and the death rates and uh, how it's the infection spreading, I thought this probably isn't true. And I was, remember t talking to my mates and my parents as well and saying, hmm, what's happening now probably should be what's happening in the UK. Um, but I think they probably just missed it a bit. Um, and then maybe it was the case where the UK was really two weeks behind Germany and the rest of the countries. Um, but somehow, probably because the UK weren't testing um, like Germany was, they kind of missed it. Um, it spread very quickly. Um, and then they can't really contain it. Whereas Germany's testing almost everyone um, who could have the disease. Yeah, it definitely seems that way, doesn't it? Is it? And yeah. I, 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 the, the most unfortunate part about it is um, the the government. I think it was a. I think it was about two weeks ago. It's all molding into one at the moment, being on lockdown. But um, I think the UK government said they were going to, by the end of April, be testing a hundred thousand people uh, a week. I think it was hundred a week or hundred thousand yeah, people. Yeah, I read that this as well. And I just don't think we're anywhere near that. And it's just so strange how they, they, can't, they can't seem to get on top of it in the UK it, uh, or they don't seem to be getting on top of it in the UK. It's so strange. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering what the... Um, um, I'm assuming it can't be like physical scientists pipetting in the machines because um, the UK has probably got at least the same number of like PCR machines um, and scientists that can perform the tests. Um, and then you've got the question of if they're validated or not, because um, what I can do in my lab, I can pipette and do research wearing a, a white lab coat, um, but I don't have this validated certificate. Um, so this means that everything's all um, tested and proven that everything's going, sticking to all the guidelines, which can be quite complicated, which is different to normal research. Um, maybe this could be one of the reasons where the UK government's really strict in this. I don't know. Or the other reason could be um, the consumables. So these yeah. kits, um, it consists of 
uh, eight or nine components. And maybe two or three of them are really hard to get. Yeah. And numbers that the UK needs. What, what, what do you think the validity of the PCR testings is for the COVID um, or the SARS-2, Graham? Is, it, is the PCR the right, right test for it? Um, so practically, once you've got your sample in your hand, um, then it is fairly sensitive. Um, of course, it's not perfect. Um, so you can see very, very small amounts of viral RNA. Um, practically, I've never touched or knowingly touched or been in contact <laughs> with someone with the virus. Um, I don't have the biosafety level clearance to do this, um, to actually work physically with the virus. Yeah. Um, but I think the PCR tests, for the research wise, they're fine. Um, from the little experience I've got so far. Um, but I think what could be happening if you read some of the, the papers that have been published recently, um, it looks like um, they're having false negatives. Um, but I'm not really sure. Uh, it's kind of a, a different world because in the lab I can have, I know I've got a certain amount of it, I can find it again, I can um, make it go up or down um, in cell culture. Um, in theory, or my colleagues can do this, or other scientists throughout Germany, Europe, the world can do this. But when you're really taking swabs from patients, um, I guess this is a different story. Um, so maybe if there's very, very low levels, um, maybe it's quite hard to swap the right place. So maybe you just by bad luck miss it. Um, or it could become degraded, or uh, there's probably lots of factors there. Yeah, it's massively, it's crazy as that as well, because <clears throat> there's so much that rides on it to a certain degree. I feel like they're going to have to almost double test certain people to a certain degree, you know, um, especially with uh, antibody tests, you know what I mean? Because like they were saying, I was listening to something the other day and they were talking about you, if you've had COVID-19 and something within like seven days or, uh, or like, yeah, like a week after it, you might not even show any antibodies. So like you could, you could be tested for an anti, uh, have an antibody test and you might not come up with anything, you know, yeah. but then they could test you two weeks after that, where it's really, I feel like a double test is going to be plausible but uh, but even then it's logistically you've got to imagine as well you've got to think about what everybody's actually having going having to go through right now with the numbers of testing that's going to have to have ha that is happening and what's going to have to happen yeah i think quite a lot of countries they do um i think you need to be proven negative twice by this pcr test so there they look for the um this rna sequence i think it's two negative tests you need to have um, so, sorry, RNA. Um, just explain. I think I know exactly what that is, but would you, if just for people that are listening, what is RNA? Um, so, just like if you can imagine a book, um, like quite a sizable book, it's got lots of um, words and letters. And the RNA, similar to DNA, is just the arrangement of letters in there. So, you right. can look for a specific, just like if you type into Google, you're looking for a certain passage of a book or a song. Um, and then if there's certain passages there, then you know you've got um, this combination of letters and words and you know, you know you've got this specific virus or protein. Yeah, so yeah, you, you, you know if you've got MERS or if you know you've got COVID-19. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, have, you know, you, you, you were saying, uh, I think, uh, that you've just switched into uh, virology. Has that been sort of forced on you due to the pandemic or was that a choice? No. Or? No, it is quite a crazy um, yeah, change. So I spent 10 years um, at the Veteran University in Hanover. And then um, I decided to move slightly more into infections because um, this is what I really enjoyed doing. Um, so I found this position, started on the 1st of January, um, then spent <laughs> a couple of weeks um, in America and got back just before... Um, but so an exchange program uh, to work in a lab there and got back just before it really started. Oh, um, so I, I, I wanted to, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I was, I'm actually working with norovirus. Um, but because things have changed and priorities have changed, um, now I'm involved in the, um, SARS 
work. Right, right. So just, sorry, just to interject, just to sort of get the back, your back down again. So what did you do for 10 years while you were working? Uh, uh, so um, I moved to, to the fish department. So I worked with fish, fish diseases. And I wanted to find out um, how we can stop fish, like carp, um, from being infected by bacteria or viruses uh, and to see how we can boost their immune system. Um, oh, wow. Did you succeed or? Uh, <laughs> Is that a strong word? <laughs> uh, I don't know. But maybe I, I explained a few things, but I, I wouldn't say I um, saved millions of fish by doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, completed it. I absolutely bossed it. Yeah. <laughs> it's done. Next. Yeah. Oh, that's, so, that's great, man. That's great. I don't even. I wouldn't even know where to start with something like that. So, so infections and things you've you've been interested in for quite some time, and yes, all of a sudden, just through coincidence, or it's it's come to a time where we've got this massively infectious uh, virus, and you've ended up in the exact lab that is dealing with that. In, in Germany, is that right? Is that yeah? Is that um, but yeah, so I, I moved um, labs to work in a research institute, um, which is linked to the hospital in Hanover or one of the hospitals. Um, I worked on viruses, um, and then yeah, because of the situation and the number of patients that we're getting, um, yeah, it's become kind of the most important virus infectious agent um, in the world. Yeah, um, just, just not just the lab I work in. Loads of labs are working on it, even if they've got almost nothing to do with viruses. Previously, yeah, uh, every second lab has switched directions, focusing on this. Yeah, you can totally imagine that that would be the case as well. You know, you can't have something so so global, so that has affected the whole planet to a certain degree. Uh, not all of the planet, but I think it might have touched pretty much everywhere. But you can imagine that everyone is working on this right now. Uh, who right. can work on it? Everyone is working on it. And the, uh, companies that ne even companies that aren't labs uh, um, that that manufactured and engineered other things are now uh, uh, manufacturing and uh, making ventilators and things like that. The whole world has completely switched, changed, and is now currently working on this. Um, which, to a certain degree, it um, is well. For us, it's 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 amazing because I feel like, and I'm hopeful that that, that will push um, faster results, uh, which which is what we need. It could cause, I mean, that the faster you work on something, the more you the, you might make mistakes. Think mistakes might be made, but I think yeah. it, it's I think with this, what's going on, mistakes are going to be make, made and mistakes have been made. You know, there's already people pointing fingers and it's, it, we're, we're, we're not even nowhere near the end of it yet. You know, a lot of people get interviewed and then they will be asked these questions and they will come back with a rebuttal of, look, this, 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 this needs to be talked about. Mistakes need to be talked about in two or three years time. This, this we're right. We're right in the thick of this. Now this can't be something that we ponder over now. We're trying to figure this out now. So yeah, it's, it's weird. It's crazy at the moment. Yeah. What What exactly are you working on, Graham, to do with it? What What What's the you know what What exactly are you working on? Um. So, yeah, I'm I'm only playing a tiny, tiny part in this. Um. But the lab I'm a member of and the labs that are surrounding us, um, just like probably every second or third um bioscience lab, are working on repurposing drugs. Um, is one aspect because um, there's thousands and thousands of drugs that are already um, FDA approved or they're already approved so doctors can administer them, administer them to patients um, and if you're lucky then some of these may also work for this virus instead of going down the, the other route and trying to design totally new drugs because this will take a long time to design them, test them and get them approved so that they're safe to be used because obviously you don't want to inject people with something and that kills them or yeah, makes yeah. the situation worse. And this can take quite a long time. Which is where mistakes could be made. And this is, and, and they're quite huge mistakes to be made. And this is why, you know, when people, people are looking for a way out or looking for a vaccine and vaccines, like we, I think everybody knows now the idea of vaccinations, 
a vaccine for something is normally take takes about 10 to 13 sometimes it used to take 15 years to come up with something that would be that would work and would be safe to mass mass produce and mm. distribute uh, to people but i think people are looking for that and they want that because it's the answer to it but it, i just i can't imagine that's going to come anytime soon i think i think myself and i'm no one i'm just i think the 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 answer lies in obviously social distancing testing and maybe a, a, a drug that 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 will treat uh successfully treat it yeah i think um ideally you're right vaccines would be the ideal case um i don't know how long it will take um i guess with so many labs and the new techniques that are coming out um maybe it will only take six nine twelve months um, but then of course you've got to vaccinate hundreds of millions of people um maybe even a couple of billion um, yeah so yeah. even ready as well if people want it as well i've already seen people <laughs> you know uh, i've already seen people that don't believe in vaccination saying they're not going anywhere near a vaccine you know i think it's so ridiculous that people even consider this but people do they they, they, they don't think that this is even real and not only is it not real but if there's an answer if there's something to protect them from it they're not going to have it because they don't believe in it it's so crazy yeah yeah i think um this has been in a case for a while now i think um with all the discredited reports in the UK, was it 20 years ago, I think, or even longer? Um, yeah, there's always a fraction of society. Well, I think it's good that people can choose what they want to do. Um, I think with vaccinations, it's quite a good topic, especially if you've got a small kid, um, that they would seem to be sick. Whenever they go to the nursery, they're sick every few weeks. Yeah, um, That's a feeling you get anyway. Um, of course, if you can vaccinate against some of this, then, um, yeah, you can save quite a few um, days of sickness and high temperatures. Yeah. Um, of course, other um, more serious conditions. Um, that was, yeah. Yeah, um, we, yeah, I think it's, yeah, Germany's thinking about, um, so when you go to the schools now, so when you're four or five years old, your kids normally should go to school. Um, they're just starting to have um, that compulsory vaccinations. So your you child needs to be vaccinated so they can attend the school. Um, I'm not 100% sure how far this is along. Um, I know with our nursery, we had to have this vaccination card and we needed these vaccinations. Um, yeah, I heard something uh, very similar for the UK is, is, is in the works and, and yeah. could happen. Yeah, I mean, how do, how, how do you feel about that, Joe? How do you feel about it? Ooh, social liberties, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to stop people, especially kids with education, going to school because they're not vaccinated, I don't know. I don't know if that sits right with me, really, to be honest. But I also see the argument for vaccinations. So I'm a little bit on the fence. I've been reading a little bit more about where the anti-vax movement has come from and how much science is actually based behind the anti-vax movement. And it's all been sort of uh, disputed. And it was, it was due to uh, autism, wasn't it? And they, they thought that it increased autism and therefore uh, an anti-vax movement gained popularity. But the problem is with the mandatory vaccinations is if you start making something mandatory, the people that were anti-vax in the first place will see that more as a, a reason not to so it will inspire them not to further so it doesn't it doesn't really work doesn't mandatory vaccinations but i can't i can't actually believe germany are already in, implementing it to be fair that's that, that's fair enough yeah uh, i think that i'm not 100 percent sure just maybe it's on a local level or i don't know if it's a national level um but yeah i think just what you were saying joe i think the, the education is probably the best way forward and to educate people that maybe not to really force them but to encourage them or at least show them all the facts i think if you um have all the facts you can make your own informed choice and if it's clearly presented then i guess over 95 percent of people would choose to vaccinate their kids yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah i think so i think uh I think it's a small percentage. It's so easy to think of uh, of this being a large percentage of people, but I think it would be a small percentage of people that would 
even if they were given it by a credible source and they would argue if it is a credible source, they would still be like, mm, I don't believe it's still, and they still wouldn't do it. But I think like anything, it's easy to see, you always see the bad before you see the good. And I believe there's way more good than there is bad. So I think when you see people, like in the UK, there's been people that seem to have been breaking the lockdown laws. I generally feel like 99.5% of the people are, are, are actually sticking to social distancing, uh, but you just see the bad stick out like a sore thumb. So I feel like th those people that wouldn't choose a vaccination are only minute. I, I don't think there's a large percentage of, of the, the, the population of each country that would act, wouldn't actually do it. I, for myself anyway, I know that it's each to their own with it, but I've vaccinated my children um, and I feel like if there's a, as a valid, well-tested COVID-19 vaccination, I would have that vaccination as well. Yeah. yeah I think, think um, we, we'll probably be the last ones to get it. Maybe Joe will get it before we would um, with his job. Yeah, yeah. So, Do you yeah, think so the, uh, um, the likelihood of there being a uh, medication for the treatment of COVID is more likely than the vaccination of it? Great. Um, that's what you're working on, isn't it? And you're not looking at you're not actually looking at vaccinations. You're looking at treatment, aren't it? Yeah, treatments. Um, and trying to find out what the virus needs to enter the cell. So which doors and windows the virus needs to get inside. Um, I think these are two key aspects that lots of virologists are working on now. Um, so I think this is probably easier to do. Um, I guess some drugs, there are, you've probably heard lots of stories in the media that um, there are some drugs that are already um, being trialed. Um, uh, Trump talks about them quite often. Um, I think the ones he's talking about maybe aren't, aren't the, the best ones to use. Um, really? I've, I've just uh, recently, because obviously it's something to do with the ACE, ACE uh, there was ACE2 inhibitors have been mentioned as well now. Yep. Um, have, have you have you done any work on that? Is that is that true or? Um, yes. The, yeah, this is one of them. So this is one of the proteins that I'm looking at, and um, or receptors, and lots of other scientists are looking at as well. Um, yes. Yeah, I think if we could find out all these different um, kind of windows and doors and um, ports. Um, that the virus needs, because um, the virus goes on a journey. It will find the cell, the part of the cell that it needs to attach to, which is ACE2 is one of them. Um, then it will go through and just kind of go around the cell and then replicate and then go out again. So if you can use a drug um, to stop one of these different um, phases, um, then you can stop the virus in its tracks. Um, so there's lots of targets to look at. Um, and lots of drugs, I'm sure, maybe some of the ACE2 inhibitors or blockers. Um, I don't know if they're really, um, I don't know how far along they are. I haven't read um, all the papers I need to do. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's so many papers coming out now. It's crazy. There's, every day there's hundreds of papers. Um, so published. in your line of work, you, you mm -hmm. obviously have to keep, up to with the relevant research um and then you're obviously trying to add to that research is, is yes. that is that correct so you're, you're saying really what you need to do is you're reading research as much as you're actually trialing the drugs that you're yeah. trialing or yeah, yeah. um because wow. so if you if you find that the virus goes in a certain direction you may read a paper and so with the ace2 work um we it's generally um, well accepted that this is a very important um, receptor. Um, so then you would then focus your um, research more in this direction. Um, if someone else comes up tomorrow and says, oh, protein or receptor B, C, D, these are also important, um, then you can also look for drugs that, could, that are already um, in use that could maybe stop and close off these doors. Um, right. So yeah, just keep reading papers, and if someone finds something interesting, then you can take it and put it in the lab and see um, if you can also work on this as well. So in the lab, when you say put it in the lab, so you, how, how do you? Oh, yeah, yeah, so, you so someone says, someone in France says, "Oh, this this drug um, seems to stop that the virus from replicating." 
um, then you can also take this drug. You can buy it from a company probably or make it yourself. Um, and you can test it and see if this also has an effect. Wow. Wow. That's and, it, and I bet there seems to be a bit more transparency between countries now in terms of scientists working together, just because, you know, you, it needs to, like you say, with that, you know, if somebody does, you, do, you want to talk about uh, trials being held and, you know, clinical trials yeah. and how fast they can get it out there and because how fast they can learn that it actually works. You've got the whole world pushing together here. I think that's um, from somebody that, 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 that doesn't work uh, in that sector and, and anything like that. It's quite it's quite uh, nice to hear that 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 would be the case that the, that that scientists are passing it back and forth and and passing knowledge and 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 publishing papers. It seems to be every single day. It seems to change every single day, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's um, I don't know how many papers are published um, per day now, um, but when you think about it, the first papers were published what four or five months ago. Um, when the virus was first detected, um, it takes a while to detect it and publish it. Um, and now there's thousands and thousands of papers being published. And what's also quite um, interesting is because so many different labs are working on it and totally di with totally different backgrounds. So you get a nice interdisciplinary um, approach. So it's not just the typical um, virologists who are working on, on this virus. You get people from um, all different areas of life science. You're, you're hoping the virologists actually figure it out, though, yeah? Oh. You'll <laughs> 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 be slightly impressed. Like, oh, no. Uh, it'll, it'll be a joint effort, though. I yeah. think all these papers are just moving as a, a small step forwards in the right direction. Um, yeah. So, no, so is there somebody within your lab critiquing the papers before they're sending them to you, or are you having to critique them all yourself and do it yourself, or, or what? Um, so what's quite interesting is, is um, yeah, of course, if we find something, then we share the information. If we find, because we're all looking on our laptops, or um, most of us are in home office now. Um, so we, we go to work when we just need to do work in the lab, a wet work. Um, but if we're doing reading, writing, then of course we should do this at home. Um, but yeah, if we someone finds a paper, then we share it with our colleagues. Um, even the last few years, you see more and more on Twitter now, um, or podcasts. Um, yeah. there's, there's different ways of disseminating the information. Uh, some on Facebook and Instagram as well, but I think Twitter seems to be quite popular. Really? That's, that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, that is interesting. That really interesting. Uh, for me, um, you're talking about podcasts and things like that. From an outsider's point of view, obviously you could listen to the news, uh, BBC News over here and things like that. But what made me more aware of the seriousness of this and how 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 quickly it was it, it was going to spread uh, and how, how it could spread, etc., was listening to podcasts, listening to doctors uh, actually on uh, and, and scientists on podcasts and and listen to them talk about things like this because I've known that they've been about that that this could happen pandemics could happen uh, mm -hmm. through to a coronavirus and things like that but you know when it actually happens it, 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 you don't you realize um, how little I realized how little I didn't actually know so I've learned so much uh, in the past three four to five weeks just been sat at home listening to absolutely anything I could get my ears around it's getting to the point now though where I'm kind of a bit like I need to switch off a bit um yeah. And just sit out and wait because it, it, it feels like it's. It, I feel myself like it, this. This it it could go on for quite quite a bit longer than it actually uh, is. I know that Germany seems to be opening a few small shops and things, but I think normality um, it is quite a long way off. How do you feel about that yourself? You know, like you're in Germany. Uh, we're in the UK, um, two separate places, but we feel, I feel like no matter what, both countries and all the countries all over the world are not going to go back to normal for a long, long time. Um, how do you see yourself, um, your own personal opinion, it's going to look in a year's time? Um, I guess a lot will depend on if we have like, like the holy grail of a vaccine. 
um, and if it's been administered to enough of the population, I think in 12 months, this is quite optimistic. Because um, even if, like I said, the vaccine's there in six months, um, you have to produce a lot of these little glass vials um, and inject, vaccinate a lot of people um, very quickly. So I guess, um, yeah, I guess it will be at some level of what we've got now. Um, so there'll always, I think in the next 12 months, there'll still be social distancing. Um, it probably comes from what I hear um, from other scientists or news outlets. Um, the general consensus seems to be it all coming waves. So in the UK now, it's not looking too good. Maybe um, the current situation with the um, number of deaths, um, but maybe this will change in six, three months time. Um, and then it will be reduced to a relatively low number. In other countries, it may shoot up again. Um, it may oscillate a bit in different countries um, yeah, until we have a vaccine or a really, really good, maybe palette of drugs. Probably need more than one, maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it will be. I don't. I don't really know if it really will go back to normal. Um, uh, I met, I wrote an email or messaged someone a while ago about normal. I was thinking normal because what's it what's it like now and what it was six months ago um yeah they're worlds apart and i think the world was definitely it will change um so thinking back about um just how people move around and how we work um like working from home i could foresee that um maybe we'll have four day weeks so we could spend one day a week at home it depends on what type of job you do, of course. Um, yeah, if you work for Aldi or Lidl, it's difficult to spend a day at home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Technology is not that far along yet. <laughs> but yeah, I guess, like, think of climate change as well. Um, I'm sure we'll maybe lose less oil. Um, things, it'll probably speed up and push along some things that were changing slowly anyway. Um, yeah. So less, maybe more public transport, um, less uses of cars. Um, the internet um, will, system will get a, a bigger boost here, um, probably across the world as well now. Um, so yeah, we can hopefully spend more time working from home and less time um, maybe commuting long distances, flying across the world. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, it, I just said you just remind me of something that I saw just the just not long ago, and the, it's just saying now uh, just pulled up the U.S. oil prices of uh, oh, yeah. the, the the demand for it has dried up so much that they've never seen it as low, and I think it's like and and that that's like just one part. If you're talking about climate, like you said with climate change, the because there are positives to this situation and uh, and just how much the the world seems to be able to breathe at the moment is uh, yeah. is a really positive sign, you know, and I hope you, it's hard because what, well, you know, I, I really enjoyed normal life before, but I also didn't enjoy the way the world was actually going, you know, the, the human race was actually going in terms of the way it was treating what we have. Um, so I don't know. I, I do think, I don't think it's going to go back to normal. I think ever again, obviously where we're, we're we can't afford the the the, the economic uh, uh, disaster that's happened and is, that is happening. It just it just can't afford to happen again. I, I, I think it will happen again. There will be other viruses, but there has to be a way to deal with it faster uh, and than than it has been dealt with. Which is tough, really, because you know you've got to cut people some slack to a certain degree. This is, this has come like this, you know, was it November? They, they, they first, um, that discovered that it was COVID-19 and they called it COVID, well, it was, you know, discovered COVID-19. So it's November and from November to we're in April now, and people are talking about the, 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 the middle, uh, of trying to flatten the first curve because obviously they're talking that there could be a second one, there could be a second wave. Uh, so I feel like they're doing everything they can do to, to, to batten down the hatches. Uh, but I feel like, I don't know, normality myself, uh, social distancing, I think supermarkets are always going to be the same now for a while, for, for a few years. I think you're not going to be able to you're going to be queuing up outside. You're going to be, you know, in the checkouts, you're going to be obviously two meters away from each other. That's not going to change. 
um, for a long time. I think there's going to be a lot of places that, like I, I'm a, um, a tattoo artist and it's really strange for me because there's nothing much I can do. I'm all, I can't work two, we two meters away from my customer, you know? So I think masks now, no matter what are going to be, and it's so strange because we spoke about this before, Joe, yeah, yeah. trying to get my head around the, the idea that we're all going to be wearing masks for the foreseeable future. I mean, I'm not doing it yet. I'm not doing it now. Like I, I'm obviously I'm in my house, but I'm not doing it out. I don't go out and I don't wear a mask. I think it's going to get to a point where you're looked down upon if you don't wear a mask because you're choosing to not conform and do everything you can to keep hold of, um, the, the lockdown being eased, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point, especially with masks, because um, there's the two types that probably all heard of. One will stop you from, probably stop you from getting the virus, and the other one will prevent you from spreading the virus. So I think if you're not wearing these cheaper surgical masks or cloth masks, um, that will stop you from spreading the virus. I think you're right with people maybe frowning on you or looking down at you or, I don't know, <laughs> taking a, a wide, um, you know, just going, staying, keeping the distance from you. Um, if you're not wearing these one mask, ir irrespective if you're coughing or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're coughing, then, yeah. What's the likelihood of this happening again then, Graham, with your background and what you know about viruses? Was this, uh, obviously it was expected uh, in, in the field. It was quite expected, but is it likely to happen again? You know, is this, is this a thing that's going to be just part of life from now on? With this particular virus or future? Future, this one, either. Um, yeah, I guess there's, um, well, you have the influenza. Um, so you, we always have different, it depends from what I understand, um, depends primarily on how good the um, influenza vaccine is. Um, so then you get seasonal um, peaks and troughs. Um, so I think this year um, the vaccine was um, pretty good. Um, so I looked at the numbers in Germany, I think it was a couple of hundred deaths. Um, I think two or three years ago um, they estimated it was um, over 20,000. Um, but so that's from the, having the flu, flu jab basically. I know from uh, actually people dying from uh, flu. Yeah. So I'm, I guess uh, I don't actually have the numbers, but I'm assuming roughly the same number of people get the jab every year. Um, I guess that year the vaccine wasn't as effective as other years. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah, going back to your other question, I guess um, there's every, do they say every 50 or 100 years, um, they expect a new pandemic. Um, I guess the chances in some ways it will increase because we're a very commercialized networked interlinked society now um where you saw how spread um this one how quickly this um virus yeah, yeah. spread around the world i think a few hundred years ago this wouldn't be the case um because it would take you a long long time um to get from china to um, africa and into europe whereas now you can do this in a day yeah, yeah. um but yeah, I'm sure, um, so in the last few years, we had um, SARS and MERS, um, Ebola as well, um, and now the new SARS, SARS-2. Um, so this is in the last 10, 12 years, 15, 16 years. Um, and this is already three or four. Um, but on the other side, um, we've got lots of um, clever people working in the area, um, new technologies, everything's evolving, um, better surveillance. Um, so maybe a lot of them can be nipped in the bud before it really spreads um, very quickly. Yeah, and I think this one, um, if people weren't aware of it before or they weren't listening or, or anything like that, I think this obviously now has been pushed in, somebody, in everybody's face so much that, that, that there's nothing that people won't do now to not make this happen again, you know, to try and stop this from happening again. Uh, obviously, like you said, and and you can't this is going to happen again i i i think we're quite lucky if you could say that i mean i i didn't i haven't died uh, yet from it <laughs> but um like we're quite lucky that it's not so uh, it's not such a severe virus uh, um 
and that, that it's not as contagious as it could be. It's very contagious, obviously, uh, but it's not as contagious as it could be. You know, when you look back, it's, made, it's forced me to look back at, you know, the Spanish flu uh, and obviously going way, way back to the bubonic plague and the numbers. And obviously back then it's, it's so different to, the, the, so completely different to the way we live now and what we have now. Yeah. But the, the numbers are just uncomparable, you know, like it, it's, it's scary what could actually, <laughs> I didn't do myself a favor. I remember the first week of lockdown, I watched a film called Contagion <laughs> and I, uh, <laughs> and um, it kind of set me, it didn't set me off because, but it, it kind of got me thinking, wow, you know, like this obviously is projecting and obviously we won't find out for another year, two years, just how many people did actually die. And I think we're at so far two and a half million people infected worldwide. And I think like, is it 200,000 people have died or around about that? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, America have got a, a massive amount of deaths, you know what I mean? But it's yeah. such a big country. What's happened there, yeah. right? Is it just due, due to the size of the country? It's like, you know, like per hundred people, it would be the same as similar to the rest of the world. What, what, what's gone on there? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I don't actually know why America is the way it is. Um, I guess it's maybe they weren't quick enough as other countries were. Um, so that could be one reason why it spread so quickly. Um, I think I saw some reports with this, um, was it the spring breaks, um, where a lot yeah. from New York went down and then they spread it around and then scattered themselves around the country again. Um, yeah. Maybe if they had just introduced the lockdown a week or two earlier, then this wouldn't have been the case. Yeah. Um, yeah. But with the with the number, um, I know when you said two and a half million um, cases, I think this is way way underestimated. Yeah. 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 Sorry, in, in the UK, um, I think we're at is it one hundred and forty, fifty thousand, thirty thousand total cases. Yeah, uh, yeah, 124,000 so far. I've got it on World up here. Uh, it's about 124,000 cases and total 16,000 deaths so far. Um, I, just what you were saying there as well, though. Like, I, I think I, when I, I, wa I watched a documentary uh, about when it first when it first came about mm -hmm. in Wuhan, um, and you know, we were talking. You you alluded to before, like it's a perfect time for for a virus. If a virus was a, a an army, to actually be like, look, this is the perfect time to infiltrate and attack the the world, to attack humans to a certain degree, because they've got fl planes flying out all over the place from here, there, and everywhere. It's perfect for a virus to do its thing, you know. Um, and also the the you talk about spring break, spring break in Wuhan. It was the Chinese New Year, wasn't it? When uh, mm -hmm. in about December. So just as this was coming about and there were people being infected with it, boom, they were all just starting to spread out of Wuhan and it was all starting to, you know, mainland China and everybody was going out, you know, like going here, going there, going everywhere. And it was just at that right, that, that point, pivotal point where it, it, it kind of shot the virus out. And yeah. it's just crazy to think that, um, you know, and that's what, that's when, when I started thinking about it. It's like, this is not going to stop now, you know, like, um, they can they can put a lockdown and try and contain this and try and get the numbers down and sort of flatten the curve to a certain degree. But trying to contain this and and get back to like we'll talk about before normal life is just it just seems uh, so impossible at this point in time. You know, uh, yeah. to, to to completely rid the world of uh, COVID nineteen is is never going to happen. Now I think it's just always going to be here. Yeah, I, w I, w I would never say never, um, but not in, it would be, I don't know, maybe a decade. Because um, you think of the other um, uh, diseases that we've managed to eradicate. Yeah, um, true. So, yeah, so polio is almost there and smallpox. Um, but yeah, it's, this, will, this would be a massive challenge um, to really get rid of it. And of course, um, like New Zealand, they've done very, very well. And Germany is getting to the point where I think the R number, so the number of and people that one person will infect, um, is now below one. I think it was yes. 0 0.7. seven. Um, so this would mean that if ten people have the virus, then and before they recover, they will infect seven. 
So over time, then this will slowly go down, in theory, die out. Um, but then, of course, Germany is, is a country surrounded by other countries. Um, and sooner or later, you want everyone to mix and mingle again. Um, so New Zealand, the UK in theory, Iceland, Isle of Man, um, these countries, I guess, could just shut down <laughs> the borders and live happily ever after. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah see this is this is another thing as well that you know like uh in terms of economy airlines are a lot of airlines are on the brink of just for of complete collapse and you know i cannot imagine right now for a, for quite a long period of time airlines getting back up and running again they're not gonna i think richard branson came out and he was looking for a loan from the uk government of 500 million pounds and it, and it, it you know and he was trying to plead to them about this but it, airlines I, I you know i had quite a few holidays booked this year uh, and i was supposed to go to greece in july it's just not uh, it's just not happening i just i can't imagine we are going to kick start planes flying from other countries to other countries uh, for for a while, I, they were talking about um, there was rumours today of uh, of pubs uh, in in the UK not being open till Christmas now. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm just saying I don't think airlines are going to be fully operating for a long time. No, uh, we actually live near an airport, um, so Hanover's got a smallish airport, um, and normally at night or during the day you can sometimes hear the planes take off if the wind's blowing in the right direction. And I haven't heard a plane for weeks now. <laughs> a couple of helicopters, a few like these small biplanes, you know, just two seater Cessnas, something like that. Um, but the proper 200 seater planes, I just haven't seen one for weeks, weeks now. No um, which is a shame because I can't visit my parents now, and my parents can't visit me. And yeah. My grandchild. So hopefully the UK doesn't shut its borders and lives happily ever after. Uh, yeah. No, you need to come back and stay back. So, are yeah. you? I know this is a bit sort of a, a bit of a leading question, but are you um, when you move jobs into the job that you're doing now? Mm. Are you still doing the job that you would have, would have done? I know you, you've everybody's changed, but are you are you ha happy about that, or is it is it is it a, a, you know is it an issue for you? Is it um, something you don't really want to be working on, or? What what was it you were wanting to do with your career um, initially before all this happened? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, I joined the lab because um, I thought it was a really interesting lab. It's um, got a really good reputation and they do good science there. Um, and the group were all nice and friendly. I thought I could push on my career here, um, do some nice experiments and publish some nice papers. I'm working on norovirus and you know, potentially um, help lots of people um, to get this disease either acutely or chronically. Um, it's quite an important disease. Um, I didn't realize it how many hundreds of thousands of people die every year. Um, but yeah, this is the plan. Um, but now this has become quite a challenge to really push on with this project, um, not least because it's difficult to really work full time um, uh, because of the social distancing rules, um, but also the nurseries have closed. So me and my wife both work, um, my wife's also a scientist. Um, and yeah, one of us has to stay at home. So we, we, one works, we have two shifts, one works in the morning, one in the evenings, and we swap around. Um, so it is challenging and working, um, but of course with the new topic that we switched to. Um, that person is, of course, scientifically very interesting, but I think morally as a scientist or even as a virologist, um, you really have to go for it and push as hard as you can to try and get as much information and try and make a difference. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm not yeah. happy with the situation, but the type of work, um, just yeah. a personal notes. Um, I, you're, still, you're still inspired to help people and it still is helping people and that's how you see it. Yeah. So uh, we need people like you that understand these things to uh, the next degree and the next level. And, um, you know, congratulations on your new job, even though it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> a 
exactly what you, you wanted to do, but please, please stay, stay with it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah have honestly, you, man. Have you, hobbies, have you got any hobbies outside of work at the moment, Graham? What, what do you do sort of, um, obviously? You know? Yeah, so my son was born just over two years ago. So yeah, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, this is where this links up to my hobbies very well. Um, so my hobbies have obviously changed. So pre, um, pre, yeah. So in January 2018, um, he was born, and just before then, I was playing football two, three times a week. Um, maybe six months previous, I was playing football up to up to five times a week. Wow! And riding my bike, I don't know how many hours. Um, yeah. We used to live actually in the in the city centre, so I used to ride my bike to work and play football three, four times in the evenings or weekends um, for a local team. Um, yeah, and then, then we've had, <laughs> we bought a house in the countryside, um, so it's a bit further away from football. Um, so uh, then I just played maybe twice a week, um, and maybe once a week and once every two weeks. Um, <laughs> yeah. And now with the current situation, um, football stopped quite abru- abruptly. Um, so... Yeah, I guess my hobby is um, getting rid of weeds in the garden at the moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so crazy what parenthood does, isn't it? You know, you, uh, when you, yeah. you know, you wouldn't change it for the world, but the how different life is. You, I, I always say, like, I think it was like two months into being a parent, I remember saying to my uh, partner at the time, I can't remember what I used to do with my spare time. Like, I can't, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> So, so are you doing anything um, specific to keep your uh, immune system healthy, Graham? Or can you tell us anything about that? Or, or um, is there anything that you've discovered along on, in your research which you think ah, that's that's really interesting to do with uh, immunology? You know, in your immune system. Hmm. Yeah, I remember I had my PhD defence. Um, I think six, seven years ago now. And the last question was um, if they should drink um, this German yeast beer. So Hefeweizen or Weizen, um, because there's lots of um, beta-glucan in it. Um, Okay, yeah. I spent three years working with beta-glucan in fish. And beta-glucan's a part of um, like a cell membrane that you find on almost all plants and yeast. Um, And this does kind of modulate your immune system a bit. Um, so I guess the answer is I do drink a few beers from time to time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Beta, beta glucans, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pro- I could be wrong, but I believe they're helping lower cholesterol, don't they? Are they something? Yeah, that, yeah? that's also been true, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So I was looking at, um, yeah, the... the have abuse for you can even get them as dietary supplements as little pills um it's everywhere now powders as well that you can um put in foods um i was looking at how I, I did work with lipids as well but i didn't look in this direction um so with cholesterol and other lipids um i was looking at um white blood cells some neutrophils um to see how and this beta glucan can improve the function of these white blood cells um, but beta glucan has been shown to do quite a lot. Yeah, it's definitely not unhealthy. So eat your salads, drink lots of beer, <laughs> and, and eat, your the... oats. eat your oats. Eat your oats. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I think this. I think there is quite. A, there is quite a a slew of, of of things out there that can that can that can really highly affect your immune system. It's just. I, I just don't know, you know, I just, I think in general, I think people should just try to not eat crap, you know, and and, yeah. and live a healthy life, you know, and not be, you know, not carry excess body weight. And, you know, uh, they all contribute to, to, to helping your chance of survival. Um, when, when things like this happen, you know, that's the, what I seem to have learned from this, um, when, uh, since this came out and the way it seems to affect people, um, you know, I've never seen more people, you know, with smokers and things like that, you know, uh, people seem to be stopping smoking now because they're like, oh, oh, when all along they've known all along that it's not healthy, you know. Um, so I don't know. I think there are, there are, there are a slew of things, but it's, 
I don't know. I don't know if things will change after this. What thing, one thing seems to have changed for the good at the moment, while things seem to be like the way they are, is people seem to be going running a lot more and uh, going yep. on long hikes where they didn't used to. I think Strava have gone through the roof, as well as Zoom, who we're, we're using right now. Like these apps seem to have just been like, boof, you know, since yeah. this happened. Yeah, I know even my parents are going walking pretty much every day for a good hour, hour and a half. Um, yeah, I think it's great. I hopefully people are eating healthier as well. I don't know if this is the case. Um, I haven't had a donut kebab for five weeks now. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, uh, yeah, positive maybe. <laughs> no, I don't yeah. know. Dude, honestly, um, I just got... Go on, sorry, have you got any... I, I know you probably may not be able to digress this, Graham, but have you got any predictions on possible drugs that are going to be... Um, or, or, or any of the top top drugs that may be used um, against the, the, the virus? Um, uh, this is a good question. There's, um, so we'll be discussing a paper tomorrow in our journal club. Um, and there they've tested um, dozens of drugs. Um, there's, there's the one that the... Um, uh, Trump always talks about this chloroquine. Yeah. Uh, is it chloroquine? Yeah, dihydroxychloroquine. Yeah, hydroxychloroquine. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is, of course, when you when you're working with them on cells, um, this is quite a different situation because um, there's quite a big difference between like a little plate of cells that you can have an incubator to an animal or a person. Um, they're very simple and not as complex. Um, so yeah, it's difficult to say. I think if you're screening all these drugs, um, then you will end up with loads and loads of hits. But I think it's a bit early um, to tell yet. Um, I know there's some in clinical trials, but I'm not sure how far along they are or what the results look like. I think with this hydroxychloroquine, I think the number of patients that they tested on was relatively small. Yeah. Um, and of course, it has lots of side effects. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> what what do you think about the relaxation on the um, clinical trials? How the FDA has um, not been as strict or stringent on on these in human trials? Have you have you come across any of that? Um, I've heard about it, but personally, I um, I don't have anything to do with this. Um, yeah, I guess it's. Also with vaccines, when it gets to the point um, where vaccines will be tested, then um, you're going to probably have to relax the rules a little bit. Um, otherwise, it really will take a long time to get a vaccine. So you'll probably have to weigh up the pros and cons. Um, yeah, I'm not sure um, what, how exactly they've relaxed it. Um, I think some of the ways you can probably cut a few corners if you're using something that's very, very similar. Or if it's already been approved. Um, so if drugs have already been approved, then it's quite easy just to um, give an anti-cancer drug that's been shown not to harm um, like a healthy person. Um, then the risk is quite minimized there. Because um, if it doesn't work, then worst case is you're just giving, them a, giving the patient a pill and it probably won't... Um, worsen the patient's condition and if it does work then maybe you can save this person's life um, but if it's something completely new um, yeah then it probably is wise to do lots of testing along the way um, I, the typical way will be um, in cell culture so someone like myself wearing a white lab coat you can put whatever drug you want on the cells and you can do lots of tests on it to see if the cells um, how they react to it and of course, if it can um, stop the virus from entering, replicating, um, spreading from one cell to another or other different assays. Um, and then normally you'll go to animals, and which I know a lot of people are against this. Um, of course, it depends if there's an animal model for the virus bacteria that you're working on. Um, and then you see how, how this works and what the results look like. Um, how the animals respond to this, um, and then you could move to patients in small scale and then larger scale. Um, yeah, I guess it's an interesting discussion. Um, 
I haven't, if I'm honest, I haven't had much experience in the um, kind of the later stages of this. Um, yeah, so, you, so you're sort of right at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. You're seeing good results in a culture, uh, in you know, in in the lab. With yes. them pass, you pass that information on to then for animal testing and human trials to other other labs or um, yeah, I think um, with the vaccines, I think there's one or two that have skipped the animal trials. Um, I've, I've gone straight to patients, um, but I've. I've heard about it, I haven't read about it, or I don't know why they did this, or why they could do it. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, I think somebody was saying that they can, because they can sequence stuff now, they, mm. they can skip animal trials because they can sequence the, the out, you know, like outcomes within humans, but I, don't, I do not know how that works. Um, no. it's, uh, very interesting, very interesting. Um, do you think animal trials... Um, have good good comparisons to humans or do you think there's a, a lot of flaws and that's why people are, are against them or what's your thoughts on that uh, yeah this is a great question it's a topic that kind of scientists can talk um to non-scientists about forever um <laughs> yeah it's, it's a nice topic with ethics and then science is also mixed in there and um so in some ways Yes, they, they are helpful in other ways. Um, they're not so good. I think it depends on um, what you're really looking at. Um, so obviously a small mouse is quite different from a human. Um, in some ways, some things are similar. Um, it's, and it also depends on what you want to look at. So um, even some types of fish um, are closer to humans in some ways. Um, than a mouse is to a human. So then you could use a fish for certain studies. Um, the other way, um, which is what my old university, my old group was doing, um, is try to make the cell culture model more complex. Um, so you can go, there's, quite, there's a huge difference between having um, one type of cells on a little plastic plate um, yeah. to a mouse or a human. Um, so there's ways where you can have um, like kind of ex vivo, you can take a part of, um, in theory, human. Um, so you can take, um, you can, uh, maybe a good example would be um, like a cow's udder. Um, so when you go to the abattoir, um, the cow will then be slaughtered and chopped up into steaks or whatever. And the udder is, would then just be thrown away or used for, I don't know, maybe dog food, cat food. Um, so in theory, you could then use this order and then you can use the whole system and you could then test wow. certain drugs or creams or infection scenarios, um, which is then a step further towards kind of real life. Um, and you can do this with other groups of cells as well. Um, so you can have, instead of having one cell type, you can have a mixture of cells, um, you can change like the oxygen concentration. Um, so if you're working um, kind of in, in, with intestinal cells, then the oxygen concentration is quite low there. And if you were working with lung cells um, or in the esophagus um, or the trachea um, or in the mouth, um, oral cavity cells, um, then the um, oxygen concentration will be higher there. So you can also modulate the oxygen concentration so it makes it more realistic. No way. Is it okay? Right. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't have even ever thought about anything like that. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, there's lots of groups trying to make um, these um, in vitro cell culture models more and more realistic because then the results are closer to what happens in real life. Yeah, of course. In theory, you think we'd need to use less mice, less monkeys, or rabbits. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's interesting. That, that, that is super, super interesting. Super interesting. So, um, sorry, Graham, what's, what's your sort of future look like then? Have you got any predictions? Um, what you're going to be doing in the future? Can you see yourself be working on this for quite some time, or do you think you'll actually get back to um, um, the norovirus? Yeah, I think uh, hmm, that's a good question. I haven't really thought too much about my future. I've just been thinking more short term. So 
the next two to four weeks, six weeks to the experiments I want to do. Um, yeah, I think with me working in the lab, um, it will depend on um, kind of the, what the, the rules of government sets for society. Um, so especially with the nursery, um, then if my son can go to nursery again, then we can both work pretty much full time in theory. Um, if this isn't the case, then yeah, we're stuck doing half days or working starting early in the morning, then playing with um, a little son and then going to work late at night again or something like this, which you can do for a while, but um, yeah, eventually, yeah, you probably see my hair's changing colour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, preach, yeah. Pre yeah, preach, Graham. I, it's one of those. <laughs> like, I, 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 I'm, a, I've got my son uh, with me all, all the time, and uh, and then I get my daughter as well so, uh, intermittently, and it, uh, yeah. I love them with all my heart, and and would lay down and die for both of them right now. It's just but there's sometimes when it's just like, oh, nursery was such a godsend at times, you know, just to. Just to not even that, I think it's just to tire them out. I will play with the children, that's fine. But after a certain period of time, it's just, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's, it is. Um, in some ways, it's great because I get to spend lots of time with him. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but if you think about long term, then um, with work, it's, yeah, it is a challenge. Um, what I can do in the future. Um, but yeah, short term is great. You can spend so much time with him. Um, we're now running around and he points out the weeds that I need to dig out in the garden. So it's, <laughs> it's good teamwork. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wouldn't, I mean, in the UK, they're like the classing like nurseries are staying open for key workers. So like, I, I presume you would be a key worker in the UK. Is that not the case in Germany? Yeah, because this, this, you're working on that thing that we need need for this virus you know so yeah. that's that's a difference i presume yeah um this is a good point yeah i wouldn't say i'm a key worker I, I would never class myself as a medical doctor or um so I'm, I'm not i wouldn't say i'm really that key um but yeah i think we're discussing this with the nursery at the moment there seems to be um differing policies uh, in different parts of the country in different towns um so the situation will be sorted soon um yeah do you think do you I think, think you've uh, got a really good do you, sorry sorry i think you do have a good uh uh, uh case but uh, uh what you're going to say then joe but do you, what's the case then with germany because i feel like myself and this is just my optimistic positive side coming out that in England, I think in about a month uh, or three to f three weeks to a month, uh, they're going to have to look at doing something with schools and nurseries just because, I mean, maybe they don't or maybe they do, I don't know, but I, the disruption it's going to cause for kids that are doing exams, um, et cetera. And then not only that, my son who's three, he's, gonna, he's about to be four. He's, it, I just found out what school he's going to, which primary school is about to start. Um, I don't know when he's going to start. He's due to start in September, obviously, but the longer they keep him off, I've heard that when it comes to September, if they go back in September after the summer holidays, that, that the children that were in, say, year two will have to finish year two or in year three will have to finish year three in a, in a segment of time before the people are allowed to start the next school year. I just think it's a massive disruption, which obviously, because of something so unprecedented, it has to happen. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like schools is one of the things that they've got, they must prioritize. I mean, I know they will do. I'm just, I know they are doing. I'm just saying like for myself, I think it would be a good thing to get the children back to school. Yeah. Um, I guess there's lots of, I think he probably needs a psychologist as well. Um, and maybe this could be a future guest in your podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, I'm by no means an expert on um, psychology of a two or three year old um, but you can see how that is different I think when you're older when you're just before finishing your GCSEs um, so I guess this is a situation where there's quite I don't know how many GCSE students there are in the UK but um, tens hundreds of thousands about to sit their exams I could understand yeah just open the schools to or some find some way of um, getting to sit their exams because otherwise you're pushing it back and this causes problems for then the A levels and then A levels going on to 
um, university as well. You kind of stop in the system there, um, especially when you're not too far away from finishing it. Um, with the other years, I, I don't know. I think uh, in Germany it seems to be the older pupils, um, they're getting priority. Yeah. Um, so our sons were kind of at the back of the queue, um, which I guess is understandable. Um, I, I, but I think on a personal note with a, a two-year-old um, just looking at the toys on the floor, he's happy playing by himself, um, but like he hasn't seen a kid for, a, I don't know, six, six weeks now. Or he's seen him in the distance from the window. Yeah, yeah. He hasn't played with them. Um, and of course, I, I'm I'm good at building castles and playing two two trains and this type of <laughs> thing. But I'm, I'm just no, I'm not the same. Um, <laughs> so I think I don't know, like maybe for their development as well. Um, yeah, this yeah. probably will be an issue when they're trying to jump from I don't know playing with his little trains by himself to then. Um, joining a class of three-year-olds who can supposedly hold a pen and draw and um yeah um because you, you we also noticed when he started mixing with other kids that he kind of his development kind of jumped up a bit so he yeah kind of up a couple of times. that is an interesting um thought yeah. Just, uh, i don't know if you know anything about this graham book you, you know, like, um, it doesn't seem to affect kids. The, the, vi the virus doesn't seem to have as much effect on kids. And, but obviously, they are asymptomatic carriers of the virus, I presume. Is that, is that right? Or? Um, yeah, from what I understand it, um, I've, maybe it would take a bit longer for the research to be done on this. Um, but from what I've read and understand is that um, I'm not aware of any people um, that are more resistant to the virus. Uh, to becoming infected um, and then showing symptoms. Um, I, from what I've read, um, that younger kids, um, their immune systems are more naive, um, so they don't overreact to the virus. So they become infected, but then they don't have more of like a kind of autoimmune over... Um, Inflammatory kind of like uh, reaction to yeah. it. Yeah. So they will their immune system will work against the virus, but it won't become overreactive and then you don't get um, the massive inflammation in the respiratory system. Um, so this, of course, if they've got other diseases or other complications as well, then it can also uh, affect small kids. Um, but this is kind of my understanding of what I've read, um, which then yeah. may be a reason why uh, they decided to close the nurseries because they can carry it for several weeks, um, infect people, and then you're none the wiser. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's several weeks, is it? Um, well, yeah, this, the incubation time could be up to two weeks. Um, and I've read a few papers that show that um, we can detect um, the viral RNA so sequence um, in different fluid samples um, for at least three weeks after these symptoms have stopped. So um, three weeks after the symptoms have receded. Pub Public Health England have actually just released a thing saying that this isn't an airborne virus, obviously because it's through droplets. What's your thoughts of that with like um, the, the virus surviving on surfaces and um, within the air and, and things like that? What, what, what do you think about them releasing something that's saying it's not an airborne virus? Does that make sense to you? Um, or oh, I have to read what exactly what they exactly said there. Um, I think with, uh, I guess you you probably also read the news reports about how long this virus remains active on different surfaces. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so. probably based on this. Um, uh, I guess I, I have to read what what they what they said. Um, but with the, so I've I've seen this report as well. Um, and I'm not sure if it's been actually published yet. Um, so this paper, I'm, I'm sure it's scientifically correct. Um, um, what's happening this, over the last few years, and especially the last few months, lots of papers have, have, are being put online and you can read them and news agencies will then cite them and use them and take what they want from them, um, which is great because it can speed up interaction between scientists because you can read and get access to results quicker um, but the results the papers results haven't been kind of proofread by other scientists 
Um, so this peer review system hasn't um, taken place. Um, but I'm sure the majority of the results will turn out to be correct or are correct. Um, but with the surface um, story, I think it was one day or 24 hours for cardboard. So you could have got Amazon right. packages um, and up to three days for, was it metal and glass? Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but this was done under laboratory conditions. Um, so this is quite different. So there they put a certain amount of virus on these surfaces. Um, and this is quite different from what would happen if um, someone coughed on a cardboard box. Yeah. Um, yeah of, of course, it's not. Yeah, you've got the environmental conditions. So you've got humidity, temperature, um, also the amount um, that's on there. Um, I doubt someone's going to hold up a box and really cough on it. Um, you don't, you don't have um, all the enzymes as well that are in your mouth, and um, which will also degrade um, uh, the virus. Um, so I think these numbers are, I'm sure, they're true in a lab, but um, I'm not sure if you can really kind of use them for real life. Yeah, it's funny how how you uh, critique things like that. Did you just? Did you read that and spot that straight away? Or was that just like, ah, instant, uh, that's probably not right due to your background and in looking at papers and critiquing papers and peer reviewing things? Um, you think you, yeah, um, I don't know. I guess, I guess as a scientist, you have to be um critical, which is good, um, because you should always question other people's results. So, even the results I get, um, I also have to question them, and other people um, will also question them. Um, and say how I how you can improve them. What's good? What's not so good? Um, I guess is this this is kind of how scientists are trained. Yeah, that's they're wired in their brains. That's science, so, isn't it? This has happened to you before. You, you've pub have you ever published anything and had somebody critique it or um, um, anything like that? Yeah. So whenever. Um, you publish a paper it's always read by at least two other scientists who are who work in this field um, sometimes three or four um, maybe even more in some cases and then you have the editor as well so there's at least three um, independent unknown normally scientists so I don't send it to my mates it's someone from yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so is that a nervous time for you when that happens then because you're like you've spent your time you know yeah. publishing this research this work and you've spent you know an x amount of hours doing this and then all of a sudden it's in somebody else's hands and somebody else's eyes looking at it and you're like oh i hope they're seeing what i'm seeing i hope this is <laughs> oh this is right I guess normally um, I would present the results either in lab meetings or group meetings um, or even at conferences, which of course we can't attend anymore. Um, either as a poster or I'll have an oral presentation and I get some feedback from other scientists. Um, so it's normally not like a surprise because um, yeah. normally I, I get certain questions, but you get certain questions and then you can kind of try and answer them in the lab or write the paper in a certain way to explain it differently. Um, but yeah, it's always kind of, I don't know, I don't know if I'm nervous, but uh, I don't know, intrigued or, yeah, I'm always yeah. kind of waiting just to see what other um, people think of your work. Um, you I guess to. that's in all, all walks of life, whatever you do, if you're an artist or a tattoo artist, I guess it's also, I, I don't know how you feel about that, Lee. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's one of the things where there's people always going to, no matter what, you're always going to get, I think critique's good, isn't it? You know, like, it's, it's, it's super important, isn't it? In absolutely anything, I think you can go through your life with a small town mentality thinking everything you touch is gold. And then someone comes along and says, you got that bit wrong. And then you're like, I I did get that bit wrong. Ah, you know, and it's super important for, 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 for critique for anyone. It's the only way you can get better. And I, I think yeah. you, will, you, you, you need it, don't you? Definitely. Yeah. 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 I think, um, of course it will improve you as well as a person, as a artist or 
scientist or whatever. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you're welcome, yeah. welcome, welcome, you welcome the, the other person. So, um, I think we probably uh, need to wrap this up around there, don't we, really? That's uh, fantastic that yeah. what you're doing for, for everyone, Graham, and keep up the good work, mate. Um, let us know if you get any insights or anything towards these drugs that may be, um, you know, working against the, the virus and um, we'll hopefully speak to you again soon. Yeah, soon. yeah because it's, it's a constantly changing situation as well. So if it changes dramatically, then hopefully we can get you back on again. But yeah, as well from me as well, man. Thank you for coming on. It was really, really interesting. I learned so much from you. Yeah, it was, it was good. To, yeah, thanks for, for inviting me. It was nice to have a, a good chat again. It was nice. Cool, man. Cool. Yeah, Bye. but it's, it's an ever-changing field. I think it's, it's a hot topic. And yeah, there's, uh, maybe in a few weeks or months, the world will be completely changed again. Um, yeah, what I've noticed is um, you see that different countries seem to follow on from other countries. Um, so if you think what China was like um, a few weeks ago and what Germany is like now and what the UK will be like in a few weeks, I don't know, maybe we'll all be wearing masks. Um, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this is what they're debating in Germany now. Um, some areas um, have kind of told you you have to wear masks. I think... Uh, some of the other European countries have done it as well. Um, so this could be the next step for the UK. Yeah, they're even talking about, sorry, we're supposed to end it now, but it's uh, <laughs> the, the, the idea we've been talking about, if schools are to start again, you know, um, where's their PPE? You know, like, where's their protective, you know, where are they going to be wearing masks? What's the deal with all that? You know what I mean? Like, I know you, they don't, you might like you consider they don't need it to a certain degree, but people are always going to be like, especially because they've realized how serious it is, they're going to be like, what am I spoke, just going to go to work with loads of children and, and get this. Thing. But you know, that's the case, isn't it? How many people are going to be, and then they've got to produce all these masks, you know? The teacher coming in with a Bane mask on. <laughs> There's got to be some teacher that does that, gets a Bane mask. <laughs> <laughs> no, then. Well, she'll think my wife. I bet this is going to be a big future. Like, because if we're wearing these masks for the next years, next couple of years, however long, it's going to be designers with the Cheshire cat smile or whatever on them, or bang masks. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've already seen, I've already seen, uh, in my field, I've already seen a few tattoo artists who are currently doing no work at all, designing masks with their logos on and things like that, and people trying to sell yeah. them. But it's crazy. Yeah, That's maybe we have all Facebook masks or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, but listen, man, thank you so much. I'm conscious for taking up your time, and it's late. It's, it's late here. It's 10 o'clock here. What, is it, what time is it there? Is it 9? 11. We're an hour ahead. 11. So, yeah, I'm really sorry, man. But thank you so, no so problem. much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Take care, guys. All right, take, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.